turnout. So uh, certainly congratulated on that. I would have normally said welcome to Sunny Hawks Bay. You might have it by three this afternoon. Uh, in terms of Rand Fairly Shore Territory, I didn't bring any slides of that. Uh, uh, the reality is there's only one shot of the Rand Fairly Shield uh, relating to Panback. It depicts it sitting in my office chair. I was in China at the time when we last had it. So uh, I never thought to include that in the presentation because I guess I don't have the same optimism. We'll still have it uh, <laughs> after tomorrow, but let's wish the bay well. Uh, I have used some uh, license here in terms of the brief. Uh, I will touch very briefly on, on uh, log pricing. It's a pretty complex subject that really no one knows what the future will bring. What I will do is introduce you to Panpac and what we are, given that we are a major player in the region, particularly for the uh, investors associated with the Hawke's Bay region, uh, and that reaches uh, fairly well north. Uh, having commented briefly on the pricing, but then give you a picture of how we see your forest investments fitting into the Hawke's Bay resource that fits into Panpac. We've heard a lot this morning about <coughs> consistency, about stability, uh, and about uh, planning and efficiency. And you'll see as, as I wind up my presentation that we'll, we'll touch on that. Um, so, uh, uh, the button. Uh, Panpac's located just out to the north of the mill, about 20 kilometers north. We are a, currently a single site operation, and that's our site as you see it, as far as our process of the plant is concerned. Um, it was uh, established uh, back in 1971. Uh, I joined the company in 1974. Uh, I've now seen wood that's coming through on its third rotation, God help me. Uh, but uh, uh, we've certainly been around for a while as a company and uh, within the company. Uh, we started out as a JV, and that was actually the introduction of the Carter Group to become uh, Carter Consolidated, which turned into Carter Holt was the Hawke's Bay Forestry Company, then became Carnold Harvey, and uh, uh, ironically today uh, is now being, uh, elements of that asset are being re-secured by the shareholders. But our core shareholding involved the OG Group of Japan, and they have stayed with us throughout, and today are the 100% shareholders we indicated. We employ directly about 370 people. Uh, we've got about 400 to 450 involved in other activities, heavily forestry uh, in that context, and uh, uh, certainly are a major employer in, in the region. Uh, our collective turnover is about 340 million uh, NZ dollars. Uh, our profit varies a little bit. It's a pretty marginal business still as far as that work. The uh, actual forest estate that Panpac is involved in is that we did get the opportunity in 1993 to purchase local forest estates. So we have basically just over 30,000 NPA of forest involved in what were the state forests of uh, uh, Moarka to the north, uh, Esk to the uh, on the Napier Taupo Road, uh, Guavas on the on the mid uh, on the southern road, and uh, uh, Guavas on the way to Kamanui. Um, it's in addition to that we have about 3,000 hectares of our own forestry. That 30,000 hectares is sitting on what was crown land, and in the main now has reverted to iwi ownership. Uh, and fortunately we have good support from the local iwi to see continuation of forestry, which is important to us, as this presentation will highlight. Um, we're harvesting from those forests about 775,000 tonnes a year. Uh, don't ask me what the jazz number is. <laughs> the uh, forestry group that we have, as mentioned, it covers that uh, 33,000 odd hectares of forest. That is all FSC certified, um, a requirement for basically all markets now. Uh, to be representing that, not to achieve a market premium, but often to achieve a sale. Although we are looking within New Zealand at diversifying the certification scheme. And within Panpac, we only have 30 or 5 odd staff managing that forestry harvest. Uh, I'm not sure how that manages to uh, balance out with Steve's team for the 40, 14 odd thousand hectares that's locally here. But I think I've probably got too many. Uh, he's doing more with what he has. We're currently managing about 1.5 million tonnes of harvest a year. Uh, so we provide the uh, support and infrastructure and transportation services and the like that will match that. We don't use all of our own logs out of our own forests because some are far better suited to other end uses. So we will diversify in, uh, in that way. Uh, and uh, we do have probably half a million tonne of on-truck purchasing and stumpage sales that we bring in, in, into our system. The main focus on, on external log sales, uh, apart from domestic, is for uh, traditionally South Korea and more recently uh, China. Um, you've got a good picture of this. Our forestry business 
is right from the planting of the trees through the processing. The one uh, element I just highlight here uh, in this bottom left slide uh, is that we are very active now, again, and following in the lines that Andrew touched on about the heavy duty trucks uh, for moving of product from the, from the mill to the port, 50% um, gain in productivity uh, in that area. In this case, we bring 18 meter stems straight to mill site that reduces the need to put skid handling and uh, um, uh, operations and uh, uh, log processes out in the field. They can work in basically a conventional employment environment, 20 k's from Napier, uh, the uh, necessary equipment, and with scaling to optimize that log yield. Uh, so we do stand uh, literally to the market to bring stems in at that level. Uh, in terms of our lumber operation, because we are a collective activity, we're basically one of the few remaining, as I refer to it anyway, fully integrated forestry companies. Uh, in our uh, lumber mills, we are producing in excess of 400,000 cubic metres of sawn timber a year out of our sawmill operation. It is the largest single line sawmill operating, operating in New Zealand, uh, and as you'll see in a few minutes, we intend to make it larger. Um, and associated with that is a lot of drying, uh, uh, which creates the kiln dried lumber that was referred to earlier. Uh, we have substantive kiln uh, activities, a very big site investment. Just sharing with you, it's not directly uh, uh, relating to your own investments, but we have recently also looked to diversify ourselves. You saw in that first slide that we were sitting on a single site. That in itself has got its own risks, therefore we're now looking at a degree of diversification which is seen to secure a redundant sawmill asset, or well not so much redundant, um, an underutilised and underutilised uh, um, uh, asset in, in the Otago area that will give us capacity to start processing in that area, also with a mind to increasing our capability to use our uh, wood processing capacity to uh, enhance uh, our market opportunities and diversify our risk. In the case of the lumber that we do, do produce at Furunaki, uh, you see there uh, the market of where we sell it. It's 50% plus into the China uh, and uh, Southeast Asian areas, about 10% Japan, 10% to the Middle East, 10% to the USA and Europe. Europe is small, but there is some uh, sold into Europe. There is about 18% that is sold domestically uh, within New Zealand, mainly to go into remanufacturing, to go into mouldings and, and the like used in New Zealand and uh, pretty heavily in Australia. So we are very heavily export uh, biased. Uh, just of interest to you here, uh, and this is all about innovation and the like, this is what Panpac produced in 1972, what was called Jap, Jap squares out, out, out of the centre of the log, and that was going to the cable drums and pallet manufacture. Today we produce boards of all sorts of grades, we'll take what we can from the logs, and we are, indi as indicated, it's pruned wood and clear wood, we can look to secure the premiums we can get for that which ironically have not increased. Paul's question earlier was a highly relevant one. The price today is about what it was um, yesterday, not being yesterday, at the time of investment, and that, that's a challenge in there for us. This example up here, that's a new development that we're just underway and commissioning on the, uh, at, at Panpac now. That is Pinus radiata. Uh, uh, heavy duty heat treated, no chemicals involved, has the resilience of uh, mahogany uh, or teak uh, for outdoor furniture, outdoor cladding, uh, and other applications, and comes out as a natural finish in that colour. So it's a, to, to some extent a marketer's dream. It has a sale value about four times conventional radiata. Uh, but it is particularly only really suited to the use of the clear wood application. That high temperature heat treatment tends to pop the knots a bit. <laughs> On the uh, pulp division side, we have a pulp mill operation, which was the fundamental reason for Panpac being here. It was to provide fibre for the, our um, Japan shareholders at the time, uh, primarily for paper making. Today we're operating that at about 280,000 tonne capability. Some of it's still produ producing fibre into Japan, uh, but that's a reducing demand with the advent of electronics impacting on the need for newsprint. Uh, and as a consequence of that, we have moved our grade capability with a $70 million uh, development that was commissioned in 2012, uh, and that has seen us uh, or given us capacity from our popular operations to provide uh, fibre primarily again for China uh, that enables us to uh, ex extend our market diversity, uh, our product value uh, and of course with that some product cost uh, and the like in developing. Uh, the plant is quite a heavy consumer of energy in its own right. We technically 
uh, arguably export New Zealand electricity using fibre as the carrier because we are electrically intensive uh, in the process that we use. That 500 gigawatt hours is about 1.5 to 2% of New Zealand's total electricity consumption is utilised on the site for those who get to it uh, this, this afternoon. The, um, I've sort of touched on that on, and I'm certainly watching time because I'm known between you and lunch. Uh, in terms of the bulk process, processes, that sort of touched on there. In terms of the market, uh, this is a new risk of course. Uh, with our BCT and B market here, currently 67% of that and probably actually currently about 75% is China based. A huge vulnerability. You might say, well why take on that vulnerability? The problem we have is that the bulk grade that we're making this BCT and big grade that I talk of here is going into high quality board manufacture. We're a component of that furniture. What I mean by high quality board here is for the ladies, your perfume boxes, uh, for everybody, your food boxes, uh, and the like, the, uh, not yours necessarily, depending on your eating habits, uh, but in relation to um, the Kentucky or McDonald's or otherwise, it's that sort of board that our pulp was going into. It used to be in newspapers, easily understood. Now it's going into that board. Who's making the machines economically to convert pulp into those board machines? It's the Chinese. In five years, they've inst installed over nine million tonnes of capability uh, in that alone. On the rest of the world, there was no such development. So we don't really have too many options in that, in that market environment. So what's Panpack about? And this sort of winds up the Panpack story. Uh, it's about complete uh, utilisation efficiently uh, and capably uh, from the forest uh, through all elements of the processing and why we don't, we use log X, what well, we don't like it, is that all of the residual material coming from both sawmill and pulp mill of a wood base will go into our boiler units which generate steam for drying and then subsequently can also be used for uh, a degree of our electricity generation if available. So it's about full utilisation of the cycle uh, when we're handling it. When a log goes offshore, all of that goes offshore with it. Uh, we're naturally uh, keen on all elements of, of, of environmental management and, and uh, uh, the presentation earlier was interesting in terms of skid sites. We know all about what's involved when you don't manage the skid site uh, because we uh, had a major washout when we had a, uh, not just a, a normal rate event, but a, uh, uh, I was going to say firestorm, not the right word, the right word's gone out of my mind for a second, but we washed a lot down and, th and that causes big problems. But we have a relationship with our local regional council that doesn't require half of the planning processes that were touched on in Gisborne. We have been able to develop reputation that's enabled the council to have optimism that we are doing things and, uh, in the manner uh, that they would see uh, fit to do. Uh, but I'm just touching on general environmental elements. The one I, I uh, uh, take most pride in, because that's the feedback I get, is that we use our forest extensively for mountain biking. We have one of the best mountain biking uh, parks uh, just adjacent to the mill. Uh, it's having to be re redeveloped because now we have to fell the tree so that'll wipe out the tracks. Uh, so we're working with the local mountain biking club to restore that. Uh, it is a limited resource because one of my key accountants went out on it, flipped over the handlebars, uh, cracked four ribs. It wasn't there for riding budgets. So we're just about ready to close the mountain bike park. <laughs> In terms of log pricing, my comment here is pretty simple and follows on from a little of what Steve presented to you before. He gave you the Agrifax picture. That's what we are seeing in terms of export log prices. That's scaled from April, April 12. So that's two years of data. Uh, what you've got on that graph is a picture of what the general log prices for various grades was doing. Quietly handing up. This is in US dollars per jazz, magic number, because that's where the market is. Which up until April was just quietly cruising up and then collapsed. Uh, through to July, there was a little bit of recovery in August. This is uh, up-to-date data as we, we keep it recorded. The red line on here is the shipping cost. The shipping cost has been relatively stable for some, or well, for the last couple of years in terms of cost to harvest. The difference between those two lines is the yield FOB price that then you've got to discount your harvesting and everything else out from. The black line was the exchange rate. Now that sort of says the business looks pretty steady, if you look at that, and don't get kept too carried away with the grids. Um, I'm picking on you, Paul. You know, the, the, the price is pretty much down, but it's back to where it was a couple of years ago, so that's not too big a problem. But if you do the same graph now and start at October 2002, you can see the sort of picture that was painted earlier. 
This is where the price was. Yes, it's quietly increasing. The falls are rapid, as we touched on before. 2008 GFC is there uh, on that graph. But we have got massive volatility that we all collectively have to understand uh, and manage. Um, at the time when that price increase was occurring, right through the first uh, decade, if you like, from, uh, up to 2008, the profit margin was completely eroded because the shipping lines went with it. So they sucked a lot out that was being gained, more or less. I'm simplistic, but you can understand the point in that sense. And exchange rate was wandering around at about 70 cents, so that wasn't too bad a return. Today we've got the shipping in line, but now the exchange rate's killing us in terms of uh, return FOB rates. So that combination effect of taking away from that then the impl implications we talked of earlier, the harvesting cost elements, the transportation cost elements and the like, are things to be always wary of. However, from 2018 on, we are very much uh, in a new era, and I'm talking here now about our Fibonacci <coughs> operations uh, in, in the main. Uh, and what I mean by a new era, I'll just highlight for you. I'm starting to feel like, like uh, Andrew now. <laughs> if, if we look at the um, Hawke's Bay resource as it stands in total, and this is now what was planted. Uh, this is the picture of what's been planted from 1990, oh, from 1980 back to 2012. This is your group of forests just depicted in the centre. So that's reflecting a little on what Steve was presenting earlier relative to what's out there in the Hawke's Bay. But you can see very different planting regimes uh, were applicable. Uh, in 2014, we reviewed that, those numbers. As we do, we keep an eye on the whole supply situation as we must have. Uh, this is how we were reading uh, your uh, estate, which I think is the 14 odd thousand hectares of what you're calling the Napier estate, Steve, uh, more or less than that. If I put the plantings, this is still plantings. If I, if I put the plantings beside that of what Pampax got planted, there's some good complementary support in here, given that you were planting when our forests were not being planted. Remember, we didn't own them at that time, in that sense. We took up ownership at about that time in there. From there, we have been planting uh, very regularly. So some, some uh, complement effects there. But in line with Steve's earlier comment, that's what the profile looks like for your forests. This is how we would interpret as being a means of way how we might see that come in. Not our call to make, yours, but uh, or through Rod, uh, Roger and the team. Uh, in comparison, if I put Steve's graph that he presented earlier today up against these, and thank you for sharing that information, this highlights again that there's all these questions about what is out there, when it might come in, how much it might be, and where you are. So planning certainly uh, is a challenge. That's selling the free harvesting um, pitch. If I come back, however, and then take that flattened curve for the RDL forests, and implant on that the other smaller scale forest holdings in the area. You weren't the only guys that were planting forests when others were planting forests. And these are the, the farm foresters in the region uh, in the light. So we've got a double spiking effect coming out us there. If we then put the pan pack resource underneath it, and this gives you a picture of what we do to manage the balancing of resource, and I'll highlight the reason why in a few seconds with the chair's tolerance, and your tolerance now as we have hit 12, but I think I started late. <laughs> is that what we did within Pampac, absolutely consciously, was pre-harvest here to secure our wood flows on a conscious basis that said we will lower our harvest through 2020 through 2025, which opens up the gap for this wood to fall in. This shows RDL forest falling in first that's not a right of ownership or otherwise, it's just using one graph on top of the other. Because of course, that wood could fall in just as, just as effectively. But that's with a mind to then giving us security here, because this is our problem at 2030. Is that in this Hawke's Bay region, there's a hole. The theme has been raised, do we need to replant? God am right you do, because we need you in the future as much as we can support you uh, if you like, in, in, in the short to, uh, short to medium term. When I put that picture back into that very original picture I had, remembering this is now harvest volumes as we're estimating, however, this gives you a picture of where your forests sit 
relative to where Pantac sits, being the green, relative to other forests in the area. I talked earlier of the other small forest owners. There are other major corporate forests in the area of varying degree uh, and varying capability. But this line is what Pantac actually needs to operate its processes, not to sell logs, but to keep our sawmill and pulp mills operating. And this is where we want to take it to. Current harvest around the seven, or there's 800 to, uh, sorry, current demand around the 800 to a million tonnes. We're targeting to get that up to 1.5. That will involve cost, involves infrastructure, <coughs> similar to the pulp, uh, to the port. We've got those sorts of issues. So uh, those are real issues for us, for us going ahead. Um, it's, it's a growth opportunity. Pampac is very strong. It's got a very stable shareholder. Um, it's uh, well reflected uh, in all aspects of the business. I touched on regional council relationships. Uh, we also touched on port relationships. We believe we come with good reputation and that's about our people as much as it is about the business that we're doing. Um, about three slides here, Russell, and, 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 and I'll, I'll conclude. Um, this is just a, a brief indicator for you. This is information that's not available in any public domain uh, in that sense, so it is being shared with you uh, quite directly. This in our sawmill is about what we're producing in our sawmill now is about 420 odd thousand cubic metres. The, the needed investment initially would come on stream at about 50,000. Will then extend to 94,000 fairly quickly. So by 2016-17, for those in the back of the room, we anticipate to be in excess of half a million cubic metres of saw and lumber output, which means we strengthen and develop our markets, our capacity to support the markets and the like. We see by 2017, because we can't do it here, there's no wood in the Hawke's Bay, as you saw in that earlier profiling. The, the wood is constrained, is that we can see our sawmill being lifted quite simply up to the 500,000 cubic metre capability. And uh, post 2018, we could look also at the Pampac side, incorporating additional sawmilling capacity, dealing with the smaller logs selectively to optimise the utilisation of another 200. So that would give us 700,000 cubic metre capacity and uh, by then we would see uh, the Southland activities being probably at about the 300,000 uh, cubic metre capability. So we have growth plans, but it needs a stability and the right to go with it. On our pulping side, we're currently running at 282,000 tonnes. That needs about half a million tonne of wood to make that. Uh, we see that getting up to about 350. Again, with this high vulnerability in this graph, I've shared you the, the sort of indicative market areas. Uh, of that nature, but um, heavily China dependent. A risk, but not a risk we can manage our way out of very easily, uh, except to have good reputation for supply, stability of supply, stability of quality, all of those issues that mean you develop good long-term relationships. Hanpak has been in China selling lumber for 18 years. We are supplying more lumber, New Zealand radiata fine, into China than any other supplier uh, in New Zealand. Uh, and or uh, now China, uh, sorry, now uh, and or um, uh, North America. So it's all about being, uh, to be sustainable, to add value, we need secure wood supply. You are key suppliers of that uh, commitment to give that secure supply going forward. In terms of the opportunities between ourselves and RDL, um, yes, we're interested to buy your logs. We're open to looking at stumpage elements, the question that was raised from the floor, um, if that's appropriate uh, in those means. Uh, equally, there's the cutting right options that, that could be explored there, i.e. we're on the market to buy logs. Do we have the right to use your logs? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, should you sell your logs to us? The answer is only if you're comfortable that you're going to get the returns from us that give you that security. It may mean we can't offer you the spikes, but it, may, it will mean you won't necessarily also uh, suffer the dips. And that's the relationship we have with other uh, major uh, corporate groups uh, in the region where we establish pricing. It can run for six or 12 month uh, intervals. Those discussions can be had with the RDL team uh, over time. So those options sit with us. In terms of land procurement, uh, all I say there is we want to keep as much land and forestry as we can. The regions need to keep the forest base there. So you've got an important part to play there as we see it ourselves. And we will secure forest land when necessary, but it's not necessarily uh, a main driver for us. And at the infrastructural level, obviously we can interact 
on all those themes such as farming, harvesting and transport. We ensure those harvest strategies and take on the themes of making things balanced and uniform and stable and regular for employment and for development. Of course, that all comes by uh, working well. How do we achieve that? Uh, it's working through uh, fundamentally to ensure that planning is the key to it. And fundamentally, my last slide, it's about cooperation and collaboration, and from that we'll get mutual benefit. So I hope you've gained a little from that. I could answer, please don't ask me a banking question in the manner that you asked production questions of, uh, uh, of Paul earlier uh, in that context. Um, but uh, if, it, if this people have time, then I'm certainly open to talking on some of those issues of why radiator are defined versus others or whatever. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.